Grace, mercy, and peace to you from God our Father and our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ. Amen. Our text for our consideration today is the epistle reading appointed for this, the second Sunday after Epiphany, from St. Paul's first letter to the Corinthians, chapter 12, those verses which were read just a few moments ago. On December 12, 1980, a small startup company called Apple first became a public corporation and began, and began offering the very first shares of stock. Now, in the business world, this is referred to as an initial public offering. And it requires a lot of documentation to be filed with the Securities and Exchange Commission to protect the interests of those who might want to invest in the new company. Well, one such document required is a full disclosure of any foreseeable weaknesses or problems as the new corporation's goods and services go into the market. Here's what Steve Jobs, one of the founders of Apple, disclosed as a foreseeable weakness for the company. Now, keep in mind, this was over 40 years ago. So I quote, The expansion of the personal computer market will require a continued orientation effort directed at informing individuals of the means by which the computer may be utilized to enhance personal efficiency and productivity. Towards this end, the company is committed to an extensive advertising and promotional effort, unquote. Now, let me simplify that whole statement. At one time, the founders of Apple Computer, now one of the largest and most successful corporations in the world, were concerned that no one would have any use for their product. In those early days, personal computers were considered a novelty, and it would take many years before the world would fully realize their potential, making them an integral part an integral component of our very human existence. <laughs> it is strange to consider that there was a time when our society had to be informed as to the usefulness of something most of us would feel helpless without today. Our epistle reading for this morning, 1 Corinthians 12, 1 to 11, begins with the sentence, Now concerning spiritual gifts, brothers, do not, I do not want you to be uninformed. Well, it occurs to me that though we frequently hear about the third person of the Trinity, the Holy Spirit, we may wonder, what does he really do? What does he help us achieve? Well, here in this text, we find one of the many texts in which St. Paul explains how empowered the church is by the Holy Spirit, without whom we are truly helpless. So, to begin with, 1 Corinthians 12, verse 1, does not literally speak of spiritual gifts, but simply states that Paul is informing us of spiritual things. That is, the work of the Spirit in everyday Christian life. St. Paul is informing the Christians in Corinth about the amazing usefulness of what they have been given through their baptism in the divine person of the Holy Spirit. Looking at verses 4 through 6, we find the work of the Holy Spirit rather broadly described as gifts, services, and activities. Beyond sharing the same origin, what these all have in common is that they are all the work of God and are miraculously accomplished through fragile human hands and miraculously proclaimed through imperfect human speech. This is how the child of faith thrives from day to day, loving and serving the neighbor. Whether utterances of wisdom or knowledge or the healing of the body or the mind or the translation of foreign language, whether astonishing or mundane in form of appearance, this is the work of the Holy Spirit in the daily life of the Christian believer. This is how we love our neighbor. 
This is the Christian vocation. Dr. Martin Luther summarizes this in his commentary on the book of Genesis. He says, we all have one and the same God, and we are one in the unified worship of God, even if our works and vocations are different. But each one should do his duty in his station, even as Jacob as a, is a saintly and spiritual man meditating on God's law, praying, administering, and governing the church. In the meantime, however, he does not overlook lowly domestic duties connected with the fields and the flocks, and this is set before us as an example that we may know that all our actions in domestic life are pleasing to God and that they are necessary for this life in which it becomes each one to serve the one God and Lord of all according to one's ability and vocation. His point is that our vocations are the everyday services, activities, and words that we use. Christians expressed through our daily interactions with our neighbors. These are all given to us as gifts from the Holy Spirit, from God himself. In fact, St. Peter, in his first letter, writes, As each has received a gift, use it to serve one another as good stewards of God's varied grace. Whoever speaks as one who speaks oracles of God, whoever serves as one who serves by the strength that God supplies, in order that in everything... God may be glorified through Jesus Christ. Now, sometimes our vocations seem very spiritual in nature from a human viewpoint. Things such as evangelism, church work, or caring for the poor. But other vocations may not appear to have any spiritual connection whatsoever. Some vocational tasks are hard to see as spiritual such as the person repairing your car, the attorney in the courtroom, the parents give, being completely exasperated with their teenager for not ending video games when it's 10 o'clock on a school night. Now the truth is that the Holy Spirit is at work through all human actions and words, however mundane or majestic they appear to be in our finite eyes. All of these services, words, and activities, assuming they do not violate the Word of God, are part of the Holy Spirit's work toward our neighbor proclaiming Jesus is Lord. Now, unfortunately, Satan likes to deceive the human heart whenever possible and will take advantage of every opportunity to focus our hearts and our minds on the spirit of me, rather than the Spirit of God. In our text, St. Paul reminds us of what true spiritual things look like as opposed to empty human effort. In several places in this text, St. Paul reminds us that the work of the Spirit is always relational, and it is never simple or individualistic. In recent church history, many have struggled with the concept of spiritual gifts, primarily because of an improper emphasis on individual identity and personal attention. The temptation to be a godlike individual has been biting at our heels from the very beginning. According to our text and the rest of the New Testament, truly spiritual gifts are not simple. That is, a singular focus on a particular person's ability, but they are instead relational, one part of a larger whole. As our text says, to each is given the manifestation of the Spirit for the common good. We see this communicated through the relational comparisons, such as varieties but one in verse 5, or to each but common in verse 7, and individually but one in verse 11. The mention in verses 4 through 6 of the Spirit, Lord, and God, while not literally using the terms Father, Son, and Holy Spirit, should at least remind us of the distinctly three, but fully one, relational nature of God in the Trinity. 
We are also told that from the beginning, the relational nature of God as Trinity was reflected in his very own creation. The first human being was incomplete while alone. We are created in and for relationship with God and with one another. Originally from the dust and later as new creations through baptism, together becoming the body of the church. Again, St. Paul reminds us in his letter to the Romans, For as in one body we have many members, and the members do not all have the same function, so we, though many, are one body in Christ, and individually members of one another. The day-to-day -day work of the Holy Spirit through our human hands is not an individual effort. It is each of us playing one part of a much greater whole. When we reduce the work of the Holy Spirit to the individuals alone, we're bound to be disappointed. I remember talking with another pastor not too long ago <coughs> who said he was taking another pastor home from a conference and on the way he asked him to stop by the local public library which was having a used book sale. There he purchased an old VHS tape of professional hockey playoff highlights he had previously seen on another earlier visit. Now, while we can debate the entertainment value of professional hockey as a sport, when was the last time you ever saw a video cassette tape player? As this pastor is a little bit older than my friend, he liked to tease him about his lack of technological savvy. But to him and to me, a VHS tape seemed downright ancient. He was thinking this when his fellow pastor explained to him that the VHS tape was for a pastoral visit with a much older member of his congregation, a shut-in who had been seriously ill. This member had only a VHS player machine and happened to love the sport of hockey. This pastor was creatively planning on ways to show pastoral care and bring some joy to a church member who likely felt lonely and left behind in our current society of streaming video and social media. I must admit that this would have never even occurred to me. This reminded me that my own service will always fail if it is separated from the gifts given to the rest of the church. Now lastly, this morning's epistle makes it clear that you play the part but the Holy Spirit provides the power. When we take a look at verses 6 and 11, it is the same God who empowers them all in everyone, and all these empowered by one and the same Spirit. While it is true that your services, your activities, and your words are yours, we must never forget that the power which accomplishes anything through them is fully the Lord's. Verse 3 tells us that even our ability to proclaim Jesus is Lord is the work of the Holy Spirit as the Word creates faith. Therefore, when we have been justified by faith and regenerated, we begin to fear and love God, to pray to Him, to expect aid from Him, and to give thanks and praise Him, and to obey Him even in times of suffering. We also begin to love our neighbors because our hearts have spiritual and holy movements now. In distinction, verse 2 speaks of those who are being led to serve dead idols and empty outcomes with the description, however you were led. <laughs> that is, by something other than the Holy Spirit. Whether it is desire, anger, envy, or some other emotional drive, human power only produces dead work. It is spiritual work. If it is spiritual, it must be spiritually powered. For example, here in Iowa, and likely in the rest of the United States, there are laws that require mothers and fathers to care for their children. While it is true that there are sad occasions in which these laws are invoked to protect children from parents who abandon them, is this why you provide care for your children, simply because it is the law? I would hope not. 
Imagine the amount of psychological damage it would inflict if we knew that the only reason our parents took care of us was because they felt forced to do so under some law. Is that the reason you feed your family? Is that why you overspent your budget during Christmas on their presents? Is that why you couldn't sleep every time you worried about whether or not you made the right parent parenting decision? I doubt it. The power of parenting and every other vocation under the call of Christ is empowered by something far beyond any earthly punishment or reward. It's powered by the Holy Spirit and given to us through the faith which he created by the word of God through our baptism. Back to Steve Jobs. The founder of Apple Computer, in several speeches dating back into the early 90s, he referred to an article that he discovered in Scientific American magazine rating the efficiency and speed of a variety of animal species. In one of these, he made the following observation. He said, I read a study that measured the efficiency of locomotion for various species on the planet. The condor used the least energy to move a kilometer. Humans came in with a rather unimpressive showing, about a third of the way down the list. It was not too proud a showing for the crown of creation. But then somebody at Scientific American had the insight to test the efficiency of locomotion, locomotion for a man on a bicycle. The human on a bicycle blew the condor away, completely off the top of the charts. And that's what the computer is to me. Steve Jobs said, what a computer is to me is the most remarkable tool that we've ever come up with, the equivalent of a bicycle for the minds. <laughs> it's interesting to see that even in the secular world, people accept their dependence on external means to overcome our human limitations. But whether it's a bicycle, a computer, or an unknown technology to come, earthly external means however advanced they might be will only get us so far when it comes to the daily living of the gospel our efforts are in vain without the divine means of the holy spirit who because of the gospel transforms our human limitations into the remarkable abilities of our vocations most important it is our if our work is truly of the Holy Spirit, powered by him and not ourselves, the ultimate outcome will reflect the source that Jesus is Lord. Remember the words of this morning's Old Testament reading? The nation shall see your righteousness and all the kings your glory. So, my friends, do not be uninformed. The Holy Spirit is at work in all of us who believe. We are helpless without him. But with him, serving together as the body of Christ, we shall see the world made new in Christ. We shall see marvelous things, both now and for all eternity. In the name of Jesus, amen. Now may the peace of God that surpasses all understanding keep your hearts and your minds in Christ Jesus. Amen. We now stand and confess our faith in the words of the nice.